popping in on you guys in your regular meeting. <laughs> nice, um, beautiful, whimsical uh, uh, inspirations there. I really appreciate that. So I um, have put together uh, yet another PowerPoint, um, but I have a lot of great things I want to cover with the group today. I much appreciate being invited to speak and share uh, what's been going on in the parks department during a pandemic because um, life is very different for us here and I wanted to share some of that. So with that, I'm going to um, share my screen and kind of get started into the presentation. So assuming, assuming everybody, whoop, I got excited there. All right. I'm assuming everybody can see that. A couple of head nods or some thumbs up that everyone can see that on the screen. Okay, great. So I have kind of a handful of sections to work through today. But um, again, my name is Angie Fesser. I'm the Director of Parks, Recreation, Cultural Arts, and now Human Services Department for the city. The Human Services Division came to us in April of this year. So we have another team as part of our family here and another set of uh, responsibilities that we're working on as well. But um, I just kind of wanted to introduce myself uh, to the group and talk about what we're going to cover today. Um, I've been with the city since April of last year. I started on April 1st, April Fool's Day. Thought I'd have a little sense of humor, but that's when the pandemic launched. So you can blame me for a worldwide pandemic. Um, that was bad karma. I'll never do that again. I apologize for that. I came from the um, city of Sammamish where I was the parks recreation facilities director for that city for more than three years. And prior to that, I was actually at the city of Covington as a parks planner. Um, my education, early education is a bachelor's degree in recreation and leisure studies. Yes, there is such a thing from Washington State University. I also have a master's in public administration, and I also have a master's in landscape architecture, and I'm a licensed landscape architect. So it kind of brought all that together for my dream job of being a parks and recreation director and, and being fully educated and experienced on both sides of the house. So I love all the plant material. Um, wish I had a little more time to get my hands dirty in my job, but I don't get to do that anymore. But I do uh, spend a lot of time down at the shop with the maintenance workers and in the greenhouse. And um, last year even was help moving plants around when we were short on staff and volunteer opportunities. Um, and I'm an old farm girl. I was born and raised in Eastern Washington and uh, I'm very connected to the earth and all things living, growing out of it. So so today I kind of want to talk about three different components here, the relationship with the city and the Floridum Club and how grateful we are to have you. I want to talk about how parks maintenance has shifted and changed over the last year and a half dealing with COVID and why some things might be different <clears throat> in your interactions with our parks maintenance crew. And then keeping our eyes on the horizon, the future of course, and talk about our park planning projects and the projects that we've actually completed in the last year and a half, even despite COVID and what we've started and what big projects we're working on in the future. So with that, um, we'll kind of get started. So first, um, really glad to have the opportunity to acknowledge the wonderful relationship between the city and the Garden Club since 1922. I saw that in that presentation. That is absolutely phenomenal and being able to see the working relationship and the partnership between the two for such a long period of time. Long, long history uh, of being a community partner. I was doing a little bit of research looking for images and some of these photos here that I have in the slideshow today actually were dated 1980. So those were, and at first I'm like, oh, 1980, yeah, that was just, and then I do the math and it's actually 40 years ago. So it's just phenomenal to know that there's been such a great partnership. And we know that the flower baskets and the corner parks and the heavily planted landscapes are iconic to Edmonds. And matter of fact, I remember when I read about the director job announcement, the first thing that popped into my head were the hanging baskets and all of the full downscape, downtown landscape beds and how the Edmonds cultivated their own annuals for that and the use of volunteers. That was the first association I had 
was reading about the job description. So your reputation definitely precedes all of you in this community, right? In parks and recreation and as landscape architects. So as we know, downtown Edmonds has a significant draw, you know, regionally from because we have more than a mile of public beach, um, the ferries that come in and out, the great restaurants and the wonderful retail shops and a very walkable, quaint, iconic, pedestrian scaled environment downtown. And it's full, part of that is because the landscape is full of color and texture and interesting plants and ever evolving, changing uh, landscapes. And that adds to those experiences for our, our people who live here and people who visit. And we certainly could not do it without this club. So very, very grateful for that relationship. In addition, as reported earlier, um, talking about the um, commemorative art project that is being planned. Uh, my understanding is that there was a presentation at the Edmonds Arts Commission last Monday that uh, Kelly referred to earlier. We're very excited about this project. We're glad or very grateful that you're working on it this year for next year's <laughs> installation. Sometimes we get approached just months prior and we really have to scramble, but we appreciate the long lead time on this. It is quite a process between selecting the artist, getting involved with the city process, the arts commission, the city council and the whatnot. So we really appreciate that relationship we have with the members working on this project. And we're very, very excited about it. And I know that will be something very special in that location. So let's shift gears and talk a little bit about what it's like to maintain parks during a pandemic. Now, needless to say, the entire department has been severely or significantly impacted by COVID. And on our programming side of our house, it's been an absolute roller coaster with trying to run programs, trying to um, adjust to every announcement that comes out of the governor's office or CDC office and adjusting to those group sizes, vaccinations, um, stage one, stage two of opening and reopening, um, playgrounds closed and then opening and do you sanitize the playgrounds or not? And, you know, remember when this all started, it was all contact servicing maintenance of that. Now we've learned that it's, you know, it's um, aerosol and travels through the air. So it has been um, quite an experience and starting during that time has been quite challenging as well. So needless to say, you know, as a director, when you start at a new city, it's already challenging getting to know your staff, building those relationships, building trust with them, understanding how things operate and, and getting the, the program to move forward and creating that vision. Well, that all got accelerated in about 12 hours for me, right? <laughs> because when I started in April, um, we were at the place where the parks maintenance workers were so spooked, they would not refuse to re clean the restrooms because we didn't know as a community um, exactly what was going on with COVID. That was still very fresh and new, right? Everything kind of shut down in, in late March. And then I started in the first part of April. And we still didn't know quite how this COVID thing was happening and being transmitted. And so I had to start in a department and, and try to build trust um, with those individuals who I had never met before. And, um, you know, our offices were closed. I couldn't come into the office and meet staff. I couldn't go down to the shop and spend a lot of time with them necessarily. And so the, a lot of this was remotely done, but I did make an effort to visit the shop as frequently as I could to get to know those individuals and help them understand uh, that I cared for them, I supported them, and their safety was really important to me. And, move, and we were going to move forward together with a lot of good communication. We had obviously unprecedented decisions continually um, over the last year and a half around facilities, around programs, but our number one concern were, was safety, right? Safety of our staff, safety of the public, and how do we do that? So I just wanna put up a little um, information about you know, what was happening the day I was hired compared to what's happening today. So this is pulled right out of a title, you know, a headline from April 1st of 2020, if we think way back then, 
At that time, there were about 6,000 cases in the state and about 250 deaths from COVID at that time. So that was April 1st of last year. The numbers compared to last week, which I don't think any of us could have ever imagined or predicted that we have 100 times more cases, right? 600,000 cases in the state and more than 700 deaths. So if you look at that back in April when I started, the, <laughs> there have been more deaths since the number than the number of cases were, were happening in April. So, you know, what an unprecedented time. No one could have ever imagined that our world would be what it is today compared to a year and a half ago. So what that meant for us, right? Um, how we established our guidelines moving forward. What did we do? How did we make our decisions? We actually had four different sets of guidelines we were constantly monitoring and trying to utilize. So at the federal level, CDC level, what were they saying? What were they recommending? You know, at one point, even dog parks were recommended to be closed because they didn't know if dogs could transmit COVID, right? I mean, it's just been such a, a roller coaster. There's a whole level of state guidelines with the governor's office um, bringing out phases and group size limitations and what should be open and what shouldn't be open. Then another layer of the Snohomish Health District, right? A little closer to us, a little stricter deadline, you know, guidelines. And then of course the city itself, the mayor um, has an old, their ability to set guidelines as well. So there was a lot of communication that we had to do over the last year and a half about what was open, what wasn't, and why. We became professional sign makers, <laughs> trying to post things in our sites and communicate through our various means as to what was current, what was open, and when and how. But again, the most important thing were health and safety of the public, our staff, and our community and also preserving our facilities, making sure that our parks and facilities were being maintained at a minimal level. How that impacted our maintenance staff. We actually had to, and are going back to now, um, the approach, we separated our crew into two separate kind of groups that stagger their starts and completely isolate from each other. Because if one person, gets exposed to COVID in our crew and or gets COVID, everybody around them has to be quarantined for a couple of weeks. There's a lot of exceptions and um, nuances to that. But technically, if we had one giant crew and one person came down with COVID, technically we could lose our whole crew for a week or two at the worst case scenario, which <laughs> no maintenance on our parks for two weeks. Can you imagine what that would look like, right? So. That means that they um, it impacts them in that work projects, they can't work together as a whole crew, they can't cross between those two crews, they have to stay isolated from one another. So projects and work take longer. Last year, we also had a hiring freeze on all of our part-time staff, seasonal staff that we normally hire because we didn't know what was gonna happen with our budgets, right? With businesses closing down, sales tax is a huge revenue source for the city we didn't know what was gonna to happen to our budget. So being conservative, we had a hiring freeze throughout the entire city last year. So we had none of our six seasonals that we used last year. On the flip side, of course, the equation, increased demand, right? Which we are grateful to have had these beautiful facilities and open spaces where people could go outside, still could exercise, get a mental break, get a physical exercise and feel safe in that capacity. So needless to say, increased demand on our facilities, especially down at the waterfront because people would go down, still do, get food to go and then go down to the beach and eat. And it's fabulous, right? We love that opportunity, but think of the amount of garbage that is produced from that change in behavior. So currently um, we pull more than 300 garbage bags full a week out of 55 gallon sized containers. So we have tons and tons of garbage every week that we're handling. And this last winter maintenance crew reported having to do maintenance level service um, for um, summer type activity in the winter. So we kind of hit 100% and then stayed there through winter and then went into like 120% 
during this last summer. So we've had a huge increase in demand on regular maintenance that we have to do. And then we've also had to change our practices about how we clean restrooms, how we pull garbage, how we handle um, doing our business. And it takes longer now to clean restrooms than it did before. And for a while, we were cleaning restrooms twice a day rather than twice than once a day, which doubles that effort. So um, as a result, fewer projects have been done, fewer small capital projects. I also wanna point out the image here that canopy um, in the yard is how last year maintenance crew ate their lunches in the winter. They could choose to eat in their truck or sitting outside. So even morale has been hit with this and that, you know, they used to get together in the lunchroom and, and share a half hour, 45 minutes together, chatting, socializing, and COVID has stopped a lot of that, or it's, it's modified it. They have to sit outside, they have to sit six feet apart. Um, and it, it just impacts morale and socializing of the crew as well. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner, when they work, they still have to wear buffs and facial coverings as you guys do, right? But when some of their work is very physical and requires, um, you know, breathing harder and physical exertion, that's really hard to do with the face covering on. So that's challenging as well. Oh, sorry, keep hitting the buttons a little too fast. I wanna talk a little bit about how it impacted our volunteer operations as well, as you guys very well know. But the city uses volunteers in three different ways. We have three different programs. We have individuals who come to us and volunteer, sometimes special projects in the office, things like that. Then we also work with um, city-sponsored events, like, a, like the image you see there in the middle of the screen. Like we have a, a Saturday beach cleaning or a invasive removal wide open city-sponsored event. Those have been extremely limited, obviously, in the last year and a half. And then we work directly with groups such as yourself, right? Service groups and the Florida Garden Club, which as you know, has really changed things. Um, different procedures, different policies, staying six feet apart, masking up very, very limited. Volunteers are considered city employees. When you guys work on behalf of the city, we have to take care of you as if you're a city employee. So that means we have to communicate the ever-changing <laughs> city policies around how employees and volunteers work. So we really appreciate your patience with that. You know, those change periodically and we have to communicate that to you as a group. So needless to say, a lot of our volunteer hours and volunteer efforts that we've relied upon the last two years have diminished significantly, and that has impacted our efforts and work as well. But we are still very, very grateful for all of you and every hour that you put in with us. Also, the impact to maintenance. Um, new programs have shown up, and that switches around how we work. The streeteries, those are the outdoor dining spaces, impacted our ability to maintain and water the hanging baskets, right? They used to be able to pull up a truck, pull the hose, water, and move on. Now those trucks no longer fit in those spaces. So they're dragging hoses much, much farther and it takes a lot more time. Walkable Main Street, our crew helped set up and take down on Saturday mornings and Monday mornings, which diverted maintenance hours into those activities. We created a new uptown market on Thursday evenings, which required two of our parks maintenance crew to work another nine or 10 hours on those days to support those activities. And then also the special events that the, the community partners put on. So like the chamber um, and the arts festival put on fourth of you know, the 4th of July parade and festivities, Taste Edmonds, the Arts Festival. Even though they are doing a bulk of the work, our park maintenance is still heavily involved in prepping the site, making sure everything is in place for them, um, making sure they have potable water where they can park on a field with a truck and not damage irrigation. I mean, there are lots and lots. There are pages and pages of checklists that happen with every special event from our maintenance crew. And it used to be the special events were about once a month through the summer and were easily integrated into our work program. Well, as you saw this year, everything was postponed and canceled and then condensed into just a matter of weeks. And so if you saw Taste Edmonds and Arts Festival were back to back on um, our facilities, which is a tremendous workload. 
We also moved <laughs> a couple of special events from Civic Park up to Francis Anderson Center because that site's under construction. So that checklist that we've always had in place for Civic Park had to be redone for Anderson Center. So again, another level of work around these special events, but very dedicated crew, very dedicated individuals to make all these things happen, but it does impact us. So I wanna talk about some things that did get done over this last year with all these challenges and start to focus on a little more upbeat <laughs> report out of what's going on in our parks department. So some really exciting things did happen over the last year and a half. Waterfront Center was completed. I mean, what an amazing project. So this entire site is actually owned by the city. So the Waterfront Center sits on property owned by the city. And anything outside of the Waterfront Center is actually operated and maintained and built by the city of Edmonds. So while the senior center waterfront center was being built, we were actually doing a huge capital project around that. And it was more than just the parking lot. It was the removal of that existing pier, which was full of creosote pilings. Um, I think there were more than 150 of those removed. We found huge, enormous pockets of sawdust that had been used. We found a huge piece of concrete that had come from the World's Fair, some exhibit or something from the World's Fair that was used for fill to build the pier. So we had to remove all of that and rehab that whole waterfront beach area there. Um, so you can see some of the piers there. We had to build a, an incredible seawall. That's the picture in the upper right-hand corner. That, those are metal um, walls basically designed with all those angles to withstand all of those big winter storms that come in and all the water pressure that comes in and out during the year and not fade and not fail and allow us to install, which you see in the lower pictures there, that beautiful boardwalk and um, the, the boulders and the logs um, in that beach area that will change over time. If you notice there are chains around those logs <laughs> because those would eventually wash out if we didn't secure them because of the force of the winter um, tides and water that come in. So that was a big massive project, very successful. We actually technically completed that in February. Um, very, very heavily used, needless to say. Again, we have half a dozen trash receptacles down there. We've decided not enough. We have to add a lot more because people are going down, dining in the restaurant, grabbing a gelato, having their morning coffee, sitting on the, the beach, sitting on the benches, you know, enjoying a beautiful, beautiful sight but heavily impacts our maintenance work in there and pulling garbage. Um, yeah, so, and what's really interesting too, if, can you guys see my cursor move on the screen? Can you see that? If I can get a head nod. Um, if you see the stairs and the railing look like they're buried in sand and just end, that is the uppermost level of sand that will accumulate on that beach. But as summer goes on, that washes out and these railings, which are to dive right into the sand, will all be exposed. So there is that much fluctuation of sand in that beach over the course of the year. Normal process, normal, healthy, you know, environmental processes happening there. But this had to be designed and built to withstand all of that year after year after year. So quite an engineering project. Some of you may or may not have noticed um, the gateway railing here had been has been removed. We did not just take, take this decision lightly, but that is a railroad tie across the gateway. Plus this anchor here is obviously very, very, very heavy. The post that the anchor was leaning against and the railing was resting on was failing and rotted out at the base and was tipping. And the maintenance crew was monitoring that and it was really starting to tip more and more. And that was going to fail at some point. So for safety measures, we actually had to remove that. Um, 
the statue um, has been um, secured. It's actually here at the Anderson Center. And the anchor is at the maintenance shop, as well as the chain that goes with it. And um, all of that has been preserved and hopefully we'll be able to rebuild that in the future. But some of you may have noticed and wondered what was going on, but that's the reason why. Another really significant um, project that happened was actually at the fishing pier. Took six weeks this year, took two of our maintenance crew offline for us but it also was using four other crew members from public work. So it was a combined effort here. But what was happening is underneath the pier, um, they were starting to have cracks and the concrete was starting to chip away. Nothing impacting the structural integrity of the pier, but what would eventually happen would be the rebar in the pier would be exposed to salt water, which we all know is not a good thing. And those would start to corrode and then we would have a problem. So this is a very, very difficult project. Um, the crew had to work in this small little um, cage basically that reached down underneath the pier and very little limited space, but they had to do all of their work overhead. So the first thing they had to do <laughs> was go in and um, grind concrete overhead to expose all the spaces that they needed to work. Then they had this fabric that they would put the special glue on, saturate that, put it up over the head, and then they had to hold it until it set and they would smooth it out and then they'd move to the next spot. So incredibly hard work all overhead, very slow and laborious. Um, but that was done this summer as well. Six weeks of work to do that. Rumor has it they picked the young guys on the crew to do the work. So they were volunteered, basically. So I want to hit on a couple of park planning projects that are happening in process. And then we're going to get into some really cool, exciting projects going on. We're in the middle of the parks planning, uh, the pros plan, the parks recreation open space plan, which is our six year guideline and roadmap for our whole entire park system, as well as recreation programming. We do a ton of community engagement in the process. You may see in the community survey that was out this summer. We do open houses, which are virtual right now. We do some community engagement table events, um, but we're working into the process of getting a draft available and out to the public for feedback on that. But that will wrap up in February of 2020. Very important that keeps us eligible for state grant funding and we have to do this process every six years to make that happen. Marina Beach Park, down there at the very end of the marina, over in the left hand corner is an image of the existing park. On the right hand side is the design for the proposed park and the changes to that. That has been done, we're at 30% design level. With that, uh, I went to the state last year and applied for two different grants of um, half a million each, which is kind of risky because you got to kind of, you know, if you're going to go in, you got to go all in on this. And we were actually fortunate to get both those grants. The one of them actually ranked number one um, in, the, in the category, um, which was very, very exciting. That's a nod to say that this is a very worthwhile project. It actually, um, reroutes Willow Creek and daylights it in the park. Right now, Willow Creek is in a thousand foot long pipe underneath the park. And that's supposed to be the confluence that brings the salt water back into the marsh, which is now in a pipe and doesn't happen. So this is basically from the railroad to the sound, connecting that and supporting also the work in the marsh, which is very exciting. But it is also a standalone project in improving the Marina Beach Park, the parking lot in there, permanent restrooms, wouldn't that be lovely? Um, and just a better use of the space there as well. So we did that last year uh, while this was going on. And speaking of the marsh, um, a lot happening around that in the future, we're hoping. So currently the city of Edmonds owns a lot of property around this part that we're talking about. So the, the image in the lower middle of the screen is the property that we're talking about. We, the city has interest in purchasing that. That's also known as the Unical or the Chevron property. 
um, currently owned by the state and, and being cleaned up. We this year were able to secure first rights on the, um, the purchase of that. So when it does become available, um, the city kind of has the ability to be the first one in line to, to talk about purchasing that property. It's about 21 acres. It would actually kind of complete um, the whole puzzle there as far as the marsh property and enable us to really um, help daylight and rehab um, Shell Barger and um, Willow Creek through that site. And again, connect to the Marina Beach project as well. So we're kind of in a holding pattern on that, but we've got our eye on that really quite well. And now we're gonna talk about a couple of things. Um, I wanna talk about Civic Park and a potential land, a, a property that's being donated to the site is the last thing I wanna talk about, which I think you guys probably all know about, but I'm just holding it out there. So I wanna talk about Civic. Um, the park project is underway, um, probably aware of that, all the construction that's going on the site, a very exciting project. I wanna roll you through the project and the design and kind of all the pieces and the budget, uh, just to let you know what's kind of going on. Just as the kind of just a, a brief history that this was an acre site purchased from the school district by the city in 2016. Although the city had been leasing it and maintaining it um, since 1975. After that, a master plan was developed and adopted with heavy community engagement in, in 2017. Shortly after that, then we go after funding, right? So the city was very successful in a handful of grant applications with the state. The council deemed this an appropriate and important project and incorporated it into the, the capital improvement, capital facility plans that demarks it as that. And also in 2018, the um, grant stand was demolished. And then uh, in 2019, again, the council stepped up and committed to this project by issuing bonds of $3.7 million to help uh, fund that. Then we went out to bid for the project. Um, we actually had to bid it three different times. Um, the first time around, there were some design issues and the way the bid was done that resulted in very high and very vague bids. So we went back to the drawing table, tightened up some things, um, kind of pulled out some alternates to get us tighter on our bid numbers and try to get it within budget. Um, and then, uh, so in May of this year, on the 27th of May, we had five solid bids come in. We awarded the contract to A1 Landscape and Construction, and that was approved on July 13th of this year and construction started on August 9th. The project is slated to go through the rest of this year and into fall of next year. So September, October, November of next year will be the grand opening of the new park project. There are a lot of issues around the park with a high water table. And so construction is, is, uh, will be very interesting during the wet season. So I want to roll through the design a little bit kind of quickly and break it into pieces and explain what's in it. Um, happy to answer any questions, of course, at the end of the presentation. But um, I want to start with kind of the big main area. It's a very complex, very full park with a lot of amenities in it. In the big general area, we have the Hazel Miller Pollinator Meadows on the north end. There's a promenade. I'm going to try to do a little pointer here that helps out. So we have a, a hardscape promenade that goes through the center of the park that kind of signals to the Sprague Street off to the east, but it provides maintenance access, a hardscape for food trucks and vendors during farmers markets during 4th uh, of July and um, creates a nice space for that. Um, to the south, we have a big multi-use lawn area, and you can see the outlines of various athletic fields for um, soccer and, and um, a lot of uh, lawn sports in there. Lighted um, sports field here to the south, which will enable a lot more playtime for user groups as well. This is all surrounded by a third of a mile track around the ex outside here with exercise stations um, and 
part of one of the alternates for the bidding process was to putting a rubberized surface material on it to make it a better, um, better surface. Up in the northwest corner, we have a couple of new sports courts going in up here, multi-purpose for tennis, pickleball, and basketball. The Boys and Girls Club, um, here's a little better outline of that. They have a footprint of about 20,000 square feet. That's their space to do with which as they want. They have been uh, and awarded a $200,000 appropriation from the state to work, start working on design for a new club. If, whether that's remodeling the existing club or building new, but that's their allocated space in there and they're working towards that process. They've leased that space since 1962 from the city and have been in there a very long time. This also area also has a skate park. It's uh, designed actually above ground because of the groundwater issues that we have. And the last feature in here is what we call the scramble wall. And it was an alternate um, during the bid process that was actually not selected. So it's not part of the design, or it will not be part of construction, but it was part of the design. And then down in the southwest corner, um, a lot going on there. That's kind of the formal entrance into the park, if you will. Uh, there's a big set of steps here. There was a proposed water feature here, but this is kind of the entry area into the, the park. Also included in here, this area right here is a, a restroom, permanent public restrooms, yay and a shade covering structure there as well associated with the hardscape. The, um, to the south of that is the Petanque Grove, which has six permanent courts, but can flex into and be redesigned into 16 courts during tournaments and large group activity play. Heavily planted, also used as kind of a reflective garden. There are a lot of benches in this area. Um, that allow for seating and shaded areas um, in, that, in that development of that. And then um, adjacent to 7th Avenue is a wonderful um, inclusive playground called Mika's Playground. This provides a variety of experiences for children and families of all abilities, and it's intentionally designed for child development, health, and emotional well-being. And it's uh, truly an upgrade from an ADA playground up into inclusive. That's a whole nother level. The Rotary Club has committed to more than $258,000. They got a state grant to do that and help with that extra cost to make that inclusive. So very, very appreciative of them and their efforts. So during the bid process, I'm gonna talk about this real quick. There was the possibility of cost savings um, by breaking out four alternates during the bid process. And so they had the option of adding these to the construction process or not. So the first one was the water feature that we talked about a little bit easy earlier. There was the rubberized surfacing to the track. There was the scramble wall. And then there were um, tree grates, metal tree grates um, to be added to the project. So as a result, they only selected one of the alternates and that was the rubberized track surfacing. So you can kind of see the numbers here. There was quite a considerable savings by um, only doing one of the four alternates. The good news is though on the water feature, we are building the park with all the infrastructure for the water feature in place. So all of the piping underneath it, the space and the restroom for the pump and all the equipment necessary for that is all in place. So the city can come back at a later date, install the water feature just on the surface level of that without tearing up the plaza, without ripping up the restroom, trying to install all those components. So we did incorporate that for an easy addition later on. I want to talk about the funding source of this. This is for just construction is almost $13.8 million for this project. That's not including the cost of design up to this point or the acquisition of the property. So pretty, pretty spendy project just because there's a lot going on in there and it's a very large project. It's eight acres. It'd be like renovating an eight acre house, right? It's just, there's a lot of detail involved with that. So, um, 
to date, we have about $3.5 million in grants, which are great from the state of Washington, Snohomish County, Hazel Miller Foundation, and the Verdant um, Health Commission. Other, oh, sorry, other funding sources um, allocated by the council are out of general funds, bonds, which they actually went back out and went for another 1.6 million because there was a gap at the end of the day um, on this project. So they committed again to another 1.6 million bonds for a total of $5.4 million in bonds. We have allocations for donations. We're using REIT funds, which are real estate excise tax earmarked for park projects, as well as park impact fees to provide all of our funding for the project. And then last but not least, I saved the most exciting one for last, the Shirley Johnson property donation. This is coming in front of council tomorrow night for their approval, very exciting. This is a little over an acre on uh, the 900, or 9,000 block of Bowden Way. What's really exciting about this project is it actually connects to Yost Park. So in some ways you can see it almost as an expansion or a connection into Yost Park as well. Large sizable piece of property. Um, we did a, a formal appraisal on it that came in at 350,000 because it was conditioned to be a park and open space. Had this property been sold on the open market, you could build six residential units on it, and it was valued at $1.5 million just for the property. So an incredibly generous donation by the Johnson family um, for this to remain open space. It also is um, earmarked for community garden and public park. So that's very exciting. It pulls in the history of the site that was previously used as a farm. And there are a handful of fruit trees on the site that we're trying to salvage. They're in pretty bad shape right now, but we're gonna try to do what we can, even if we need to take cuttings. Um, we're gonna try to preserve those as much as we can. Some small expenses related to the site, some back taxes, title insurance and attorney fees, but a million and a half dollar pro, you know, piece of property for $40,000 is a pretty good deal, right? Some images of the site. Um, this was taken in January of this year. You see all the leaves are off. The, there's a phenomenal big leaf maple right in front of the house. You can see that there in the lower image, a little leafed out a little bit more. The photos do not do it justice. It is magnificent. It is very, very beautiful and big and uh, just stellar. Um, these are some of the little outbuildings on the site. This is a, a shed here, the very edge of the shed on this edge. And this image is actually right here in this photo. So we have this shed building, we have a metal building here. And then if you see this in the background, there's actually another outbuilding that um, has lost part of its roof over the years. So we do have a lot of um, kind of cleanup on the site, a lot of work to do. The house is inhabitable, um, so we will probably demo. There's, there's no real um, ability to salvage it and repurpose it into something, um, so we'll probably end up um, demoing it. I just want to make note in the lower right-hand corner, everything green you see here is actually one holly tree. I am calling it the original holly tree of the Pacific Northwest. I've never seen one so large. <laughs> so we have some invasive material in the site that we're gonna have to kind of get in and start to take care of. Obviously the blackberry, which loves to run wild, but we have some holly issues. I wanna have um, Deb Dill, our urban forester, get on site very soon and um, kind of do an assessment of the trees so we can start taking care of them as soon as possible. A lot of the fruit trees are kind of found down in this area. If you look, you can almost see the grid pattern of three of them right here, another one here, and another one here and here. So there's some pretty cool remnant of that farmstead that we're gonna to try to preserve. So again, council approval tomorrow night, we're gonna secure the site, keep maintaining it, an inventory of the trees and vegetation on site, start rehabbing and taking care of those. And then eventually there will be a community process of a master plan of the site, taking into consideration, obviously, her wishes for the property, um, as well as results from the pros plan, what our priorities are, communities, uh, 
um, property community wise what this park property can do for our, our community as well so um, I know I have ripped through a lot of information, um, but there's just lots to share. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions, and I'm going to stop doing my screen share so I can see folks up there. So happy to, whew, I did it, one minute to go. <laughs> I was tracking that pretty close. So um, happy to answer questions at this time. Are you gonna um, connect that Shirley Johnson's house to, uh, I mean, that property to Yost Park? Yes, that'll be an easy connection. There's currently, I think, just a chain link fence between mm -hmm. the two. Um, the Johnson property is actually pretty level. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is, if you're on Bowden Way, it does tilt down at Bowden Way, but the, the high point of the property is actually kind of the Southeast corner and just very gently slopes into Yost to it's almost, it's. For the most part, for Edmonds, it's a level site, right? Let's be real. <laughs> it's a pretty level site and pretty open in some places. But yeah, it'll be a nice connection into Yoast, maybe help with some of the parking issues we have with Yoast, but a nice, another way to enter Yoast Park, right? Yeah. Off of that way. Yeah. Anybody has any questions? So I, I see a hand, Bonnie. It looks like Bonnie has a hand up. So go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll answer questions. I see one in chat as well that I'll address. Down at City Park, down at the, um, <laughs> the water right by the ferry and the water area that you were talking about and the building, the public building. I can't even think of the name. The waterfront. Uh, Water, yeah, uh, waterfront center. Yeah. Okay, okay, yes. yes Are yes. there any plans for an additional restroom anywhere near that? Because you neither either have to go to the ferry to get a restroom or at the other far end. Right, so at the waterfront center, um, there are no short-term plans to install a public restroom. Okay. Once we get through this COVID ridiculousness, um, there is a public restroom in the waterfront center, um, right. right? There are restrooms at Olympic beach at the end of the fishing pier. Mm -hmm. There are, I believe, public restrooms associated with the port, um, kind of in the Marina area. And then eventually with Marina beach park, there will be permanent restrooms there as well. And then turning and heading North brackets landing North has permanent restrooms as well. So there's kind of the, the restroom tour of the beach. I, I can put that together sometime. That's kind of fun. And Just then downtown, um, you know, right downtown right next to City downtown. Hall, there are public restrooms as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to ask a question about the community garden on the property, on the Johnson property. Um, when you say community garden, what do you mean by that? My interpretation, my professional interpretation of community garden, I mean, that you could be defined several ways, but I think what's most commonly embraced with that term are probably garden plots as part of it, right? That um, garden beds or areas that people can um, lease or use for the year. But I think there's also, when you say community garden, I think there's opportunity for groups to come in and um, do education, do community efforts, right? Um, educational programs about how to prune fruit trees, right? Or um, the ability to learn um, like a demonstration garden, right? That people can learn what's drought tolerant mean? What does a drought tolerant planting mean? How to grow fruits and vegetables? Um, I think there are a lot of definitions of community garden. And that's something to definitely explore during the, um, the, the park planning process and the design of that park. Does the city own the current demonstration garden that's over on Pine? That garden, um, the city owns the property, but a different group does the work on the garden. So I don't know if own is the word, we own the property but a, um, a different group actually maintains it, plants it, 
does the signs and does all the activity around it. Okay. Any questions? Got some good hands going up. Um, how about Linda Murray? I'm just gonna pick names. <laughs> uh, the uh, dog park. I couldn't see if that still exists. It does, your... it does. Actually, great question. Um, so the, the, the dog group was involved with the design of that park and um, uh, we are retaining the dog park area. And what's gonna happen is actually where Willow Creek is daylighted. So if you know where the trestle is in the railroad, right? There's an existing trestle that was built in, uh, basically a culvert under the railroad. Thank goodness that is there because you, it's very hard to work with the railroad and go underneath them. So that's in place. That's where Willow Creek will come out and pretty much straight line out to the sound. So the Willow Creek will divide, actually, the dog park will be um, from the Willow Creek down to the end of the park where it is now, and then the rest of the park. There are two really amazing cool bridges that will be built over Willow Creek to access the dog park, but it also provides all these really great educational opportunities to have interpretive signs like on or near the bridges, because people will be able to walk across the bridge and look down and see salmon coming back up that stream at some point. Wow. So, yeah, so the dog park, the dog park users were part of the design process. The dog park is a little smaller. I will be, I will admit that that is a little smaller, but they agreed to it. So, yeah. Thank you. Great question. All right. Who else? Janice. Yes, I have, I appreciate all the information about all the projects that are going on because they're numerous and they really impact the community. But in terms of beautification, we haven't talked much about that and what the projection is with everything that's been part of the last year and a half and with the, some of the existing situations that are part of the beautification thing. And I have noticed two areas right now that are in development and haven't been redeveloped for some time now. And that's along Edmonds Way as it comes toward the ferry sign and the turnoff to go down to the ferry traffic. Mm -hmm. There are some beds there that had been part of state property, I believe for a long time. They're, they're median strips, those areas I'm curious about. And the other is the welcome to Edmonds sign, which magically I noticed had changed when I drove by it the other day. So I'm, so I'm really interested to hear about that. Right, right. So um, the, the state property, are you talking about the landscape islands in the road or yes, outside the media, the road? Yeah, the ones that are in the middle of the road. There's two long ones right. that as you approach the sign that tells the billboard that tells you how long your ferry wait's going to be. Okay. So my understanding is some of those, the um, Euonymus, the burning bushes, I believe were, were taken out by our crew. I have been told that those will be replaced. So, um, and I know, like I said, you can see the impact we've had on maintenance. Our projects have really almost ground to a halt um, because of that impact. So I'm not quite sure, more than likely that planting would happen obviously not during the summer, right? That we have to be smart about when we're planting. I don't know if those islands are irrigated. I would be surprised if they are. So that means planting during the winter season is even more important, right? To make sure that uh, we don't have a high mortality rate on the plants that go in. I can get back to Janice on, on that. That's um, Parks Maintenance could probably tell me when that's gonna be scheduled. Yeah, I'm the gateway of sign. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I'm just curious because uh, having worked in the parks department, I know that there was some question about state maintenance or parks maintenance. And I think for our group, it's been brought up in the recent past about that area being in need of main maintenance. And so it's interesting that I've noticed that things have been taken out there. So I'm wondering, will parks approach that then? I believe Parks is the one who took it out. So I think it, Parks is responsible for putting it back in. And, okay. And, and so, then you're welcome yeah. to Edmund's song. 
Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm learning a lot of things about this community and I, I've come in and learned a lot of history that, you know, here's a situation that is state owned. I would yes. think that state would maintain it, but yet parks is maintaining it, right? Yes. It's just a big impact to us. So there are things that I would like to drill into a little bit more, but we have priorities right now. Gateway sign. I'm almost afraid to say it out loud, but yes, the gateway sign process has project has started. Um, the, if you notice, we've removed plant material. Um, the old sign will be removed, but we have to build a new um, kind of pad and area for the new sign. We're actually um, pushing it out a little bit and closer to oncoming cars, if you will, I'm trying to describe the new location for better visibility. And so that the next thing you'll see is soil and rocks being brought in to build the pad. And then once the pad is built, um, the foundation, the footings for the new sign have to be dug in and poured and cured. So that will take a little bit of time. Then the new sign will be placed, which is pretty big and pretty significant. So it takes special equipment to do that. And then the landscaping around that, the irrigation, rock placement, and planting will help happen around that. And then old sign will come out at some point. We're still trying to decide when the sign will be actually visible. We're thinking of actually kind of installing it and covering it and then having a big de you know, debut or, or unveiling because it is such a significant and visible project. But I knew once the minute we even moved something in that site, I was gonna start getting questions. So <laughs> you're, you're right on the money. So is, um, is I, there a, a visible plan that we can see about what the finished project will be like? Um, that there, I've been told there's a planting plan that's done. Um, Clayton Moss is involved with that because he designed the sign and he's very much involved with the planting plan that's being done by Deb Dill. So they're working together on that to make sure that his vision is uh, reflected and that the plant material works with that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Angie, for such an informative um, presentation. Yes, of um, course, anytime. Yeah, we're so excited for all the new projects. I know you guys went through some amazing challenging time this during the COVID and be able to um, still you know complete completed so many great projects and worked um, a lot of long hours and um, all that hard work we really appreciate all the things you guys do and uh, we take a you know granted of all these beautiful things happening to our city yeah. so thank you so much for all that and thank you for coming to um, our club and, and share all the things going on. Now we have so much more um, understanding and to understand what's going on. So it's, yeah. been, it's been such a treat to have you. And Thank thanks you. everybody for all the great questions. Yes. So we look forward to seeing- I have one more question. Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, I'm Trudy. And um, I'm so excited about the Shirley Johnson property because it's sort of close to my house. And I remember talking to that lady years ago. Wow. I'm so excited that uh, it's going to be part of our park department. But that brings me to the question of a connection to Yost Park. And I'm thinking of my grandkids. And this is totally off of what we've been talking about. But how safe is Yost Park? As far as... Um, uh, indigents living there, um, uh, you know, shot things laying in the yard, uh, in the trails. I, I would like to bring my grandkids there, but I'm, <laughs> I just, uh, have visions of, um, needles all over. Do you see that as a problem there? No, no. We, you know, there's. Are there people we living? Do not, we do not have. If you're if you're asking if we have like homeless camps in right. Ghost Park, we do not. We do not. Okay. Um, our maintenance crew obviously is there quite a bit, at least daily. Um, you know, we're still operating the pool right now. The pool is actually going into next month. 
um, and our maintenance wow. staff around the pools there daily as well, plus regular maintenance on the park, on the trails, the parking lot, the whole system, the tennis courts, um, which are now pickleball courts for the most part. And there's a lot of visibility. Um, there, <laughs> yeah, I see someone laughing about pickleball. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, every park everywhere has issues of probably behavior that people aren't comfortable with. Sometimes there's somebody sleeping on a bench or, you know, behavior that doesn't make people really comfortable. But I think generally speaking, all the parks in the system are very safe. And um, we have a lot of eyes and ears in our parks that are highly used, which helps with that security issue. And once we find any issues, um, the parks crew or members of the public report that to us immediately. Uh, we work with our police and our public safety efforts to increase patrols and deal with some of those issues. So yeah, I think it's safe. Go, go play in Yost, go play on the playground, walk on the trails, check out the pool. Um, I think you'll see that it's safe. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So anyway, um, thanks again, Angie, for your time. And um, yeah, we're very excited for um, upcoming great projects, Edmonds. And also we are um, hopefully, you know, um, we work with the Parks Department to celebrate our 100th year anniversary yeah. as well. So thank you all for your work and your commitment to the organization. I'm looking forward to the art project and all the amazing work that you guys do. And even Art on the Fence is, is lovely. I'm looking forward to that too. So good. Thank, thank you very much. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. And does anybody have any other announcements before we go? Well, I am thinking that we should all um, be just putting our little uh, creative juices into wreath making this year. It's going to be coming up really quickly. That's true. So hopefully people will be involved and excited about participating. We'll figure out ways that we can do it and it'll work out well for everyone. And you know, we're not selling at Joyce's thing this year. So we have to decide where to sell. There'll be more information, but I just think it's a good, a good thing to put out there to the group that we are going to be yeah. planning to work on that project again. This, so this fall, I guess the uh, daffodil plant planting and the wreath making, those yeah. are the big events coming. So hopefully um, all of you will be able to participate. In. Okay. Well, we'll have a great. Patty has something. Oh, Patty. Yeah. Okay. Patty. Uh -oh. and, and so does Linda. Uh, I just want to say if you're downtown Edmonds on the Salt and Iron uh, building on four, on fourth, just north of Maine, there is a beautiful new mural. It's done in Japanese wood print style, and it's a crane and waves, and it's in honor of the sister city, Hekanon. So take a look at it. It was finished about a week ago. Oh, gorgeous. Linda. Oh, you got to unmute. Linda, unmute. Can't hear you. Got it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, daffodils. Uh, just an idea. Um, if you're buying bulk daffodils, how about? Uh, members of the club, especially that are in Edmonds, have gardens around Edmonds, uh, planting daffodils uh, visibly in their gardens and getting bulk from you, from us. Yeah, I mean, we want any bulbs, right? Because right now we are, um, I was just told that, that um, bulbs, people are buying like crazy. So we are already kind of late. So Anybody who can donate, get it, you know, whatever, you know, we wouldn't want to collect as many bulbs as we could. So, so the club isn't planning to buy a big bulk of them? We do, we do too. Yeah, we are. Because we I was just wondering to add to that and then make them available to members at a whatever it costs us. Yeah, so we will we'll definitely buy bulk a lot as much as we could and then maybe, yeah, we can sell it too you know, members and, and encourage them to have, you know, a nice planting in their garden so that right. they all yeah. come together yeah. around town. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We celebrate daffodils March, well, April, whatever. But we, first of all, we got to get the daffodils. So if you guys, 
have extra daffodils also, um, you know, would love to have it. So anyway, anybody else? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming and hopefully you have a good week and we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. everybody.